What's up, everyone? Welcome back for another Rings of Power interview at San Diego Comic-Con 2022. More of the cast is here. You guys are incredible. You're delightful. I'm so excited for you all. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. All right, I'm starting off with a big group question here. So you are working on one of like the biggest franchises in on-screen history now. I was about to say film history, but you're bringing it to series format right now. And it's a gigantic production. But can you each tell me something about it that felt like intimate and personal, whether it's something that you were able to bring that made your voice heard or something where you saw another cast member or crew member do something that they were so purely passionate about. Can I say it? Yeah. Okay, so I, um, I, what really resonates with me with Bronwyn is I was pre-med, so I have a degree in biology, I was gonna be a doctor. I only started acting in my mid twenties and she's a healer. So we have that in common. And then also she is uh, from the Southlands and her ancestors chose bad, or evil over good and she's sort of she and her people are trying to redeem themselves and prove that they can be trusted and there's sort of this activist inner activist in her and I'm a human rights activist so I always think of Bronwyn as sort of a fantastical version of myself I'm deeply deeply passionate about like if I was to be in a fantasy this is who I would be but wait I am like that is me so it's it's bizarre and surreal and and super cool it's meant to be my name is Lloyd and I'm playing Elendil. And I think it's a really good question because the, the epic nature of the production, as you say, this enormous franchise, and you, you can easily get sucked into that as an idea. And then, you know, we started and we, we rehearsed. We, we had JD and Patrick in the room. We had, a, in my case, we had the, the, the director, Wayne, with, with us. And then we just got into the details. And, and, and it's something that I've done since I was 18 and a professional actor. It's just the same thing just trying to trying to tell the same story collectively as truthfully as we can and that and that all of the all of the exterior just just fades away and it's uh, that was the beauty of this the, the collaboration and the sense that this is how we this is how we make something when I think about the personal I think about the fact that I was um, shooting at home I live in Auckland and some of the studios we were shooting in were some of the places I'd done my first jobs out of drama school I'd seen those buildings a million times. I'd seen some beautiful work done in there. But to arrive and to see the city of Numenor built on the back lot <laughs> was this incredible marriage of the epic, the out of this world, and a place you know that's had my heart for 10 years. It was incredible. And it was shockingly collaborative. You know, they've hired the best craftspeople on the planet to create these worlds. But at the same time, you've got someone like Kate Howley, who is a genius, who's asking your opinion and going to actually listen to you. Um, she had these beautiful rings for the king, and I think we spoke about it the other night. Um, I didn't know if I was allowed to say it. No, no, of course. Um, uh, she had these beautiful rings uh, for the king, and they, they each have a specific meaning and a story in themselves. And my comment was, but I also want to um, illustrate something about his uh, warrior past and then when I came back in she had similar rings that when you make a fist interlock into brass knuckles like that that level of collaboration you don't imagine will be readily available but but it is you, you're really part of the conversation and it's collaboration at its best I love that touch about this kind of stuff all right, Nazneen, specific character question for you now. I believe you've described her as strong and direct, and it just made me curious. Is there anything about her past experiences or the people that she surrounded herself with that have brought those qualities out in her? I think that's a really great question. She's a bit of an outcast because she's so strong minded and strong willed and um, she's a single mother and she's in this forbidden romance with an elf and sort of frowned on uh, by her community. Um, so she's had to, she's been forced to sort of prove herself and speak louder and more directly to um, her fellow people. And um, yeah, I think when you, you're sort of deemed as the outcast and a little bit crazy, like you, you know, you're frowned on, then you, you tend to become a little bit more sort of um, forceful in the way you, you sort of get your message across. Speaking of the elf human relationship, what is something about the two of them that makes them like natural immediate partners? But then also what is something about that elf human differentiation that 
gives them something that they still need to, to overcome, something that's a little more difficult to process. Yeah, I mean, it's the age age long sort of forbidden aspect of an elf and a human are not supposed to be together. Um, but on the other hand, they're both sort of outcasts. They, they feel sort of misplaced among their own beings. You know, him as an elf, he's not, um, he's a poor elf's elf and I'm a poor man's human. If you compare like the Southlanders to the Numenorians, they're covered in dirt and they're, you know, we're, we're r rough and rugged. And um, he is also sort of that to, in his own world. And so that outcastness is uh, what draws us together. And But also we have a, lo a deep love and connection to nature. He's obviously an elf, so he does. And I am a, a herbalist or a, or a healer, so I'm surrounded by, by herbs. So that connects us. Um, but then we're so, many, so different in the way we carry ourselves, in the way he's so silent. He's a sort of a, a stable and calm presence. And I am sort of more, I'm, I'm kind of like Ruby, played by uh, Renee Zellweger in Cold Mountain, if you will. Okay. Yeah. I have so many follow-ups. I wish we had like hours and hours to talk right now. Lloyd, for you with Elendil, you've said that he's not really someone who wanted this responsibility. So it was making me wonder if he didn't wind up having this responsibility thrust on him, where would he have gone in life? What did he envision the best possible life for himself being? Well, in terms of uh, of where we see him start the series, you know, he, he is a, he's this very capable ship's captain and he's trying to bring up these three adult children but he's recently been widowed so 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 the turbulence within the family uh is something that he's just trying to calm he's trying to find calm waters uh, enjoy my imagery from being a, a, a sea nation um but the uh so so i think it's a, it, it's definitely a safe haven is what he's seeking and he he gradually gets drawn in he can feel and i think it's very tolkienian the idea that when when all of these characters, and you see it very much in the books in Lord of the Rings, that they suddenly realize where their fate lies. They understand that they have a fate. Um, and so it's it's a battle that, that we all have as humans between your head and your heart and where, where your heart, your instinct is telling you to go and where your head might want to in a different direction. So so that that's that's something of, of, of his theme. But the fascinating thing to me about Elendil is so so there are there are a few signposts on the way that Tolkien has has given us. We have to get to the you know to the last alliance of elves and men, Elendil, King Gilgalad, along with Galadriel and Elrond. But but how how does he get here? But but talking to fans this week, it was just so so many people have real possession of Elendil. They he's he's a he's a, it's like he's a he's a hero archetype, but based on very little knowledge. And I and I, I posed the question to a few people that if the ring was on the other finger, and rather than Isildur getting the ring, it was Elendil that got the ring, would he throw it into the fire? And I, I asked Corey Olsen, who's the who's the the Tolkien professor, this question. He goes, no. And immediately said it was such an emotional reaction. I was like, okay, you're so invested in that. And I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I would ponder or posit that Tolkien might say it's unknown as to whether he would because at the moment of holding that ring, the fall is apparent in, in every man and he's a fallible human being. So uh, yeah, that's that's where I feel with him. A real privilege to play him and a great responsibility. I love thinking about what ifs like that. All right, Leon, for you, how does Kevin feel about his father? <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Uh, Farazan is a great man, and I think Kemen, the, the sons of powerful kids, the children of powerful people, I think, can fall into two categories, you could argue. They can try and um, match and outdo their parents, or they can coast with a level of entitlement. And I think he's more in that category at the point we meet him. He's, um, you know, he's landed him in a position of incredible privilege. He's living in a golden age. He's got everything he's ever wanted. There's no real um, desire for that to go away. And so I think his dad's frustration with him is that he's kind of been a parrot. He's not bringing any new ideas to the table because the ideas of the day have served him really well personally. And his journey is um, one where he's going to have to interrogate what he stands for and what he thinks is worth fighting for and what that fight might actually entail. All right, they're going to make me leave with you, but Ben, I'm going to give you my last question. So I know he senses evil more strongly than anyone else out there. When he senses it, who is his go-to person to tell that to? Whether it's someone that will like believe him in terms of the severity of the evil he senses, or even just someone to you know get it off his chest so he could talk about it with someone. <laughs> That's a great question. I think when he goes to ponder, he probably keeps it to himself. 
it, it's one of those things where, where's the king? Oh, he's gone for a stroll. Oh, no. But when it's time for action um, and he needs proper counsel, he goes to Celebrimbor. Um, they have a shared experience, an understanding of loss, and also the importance of reinvesting and protecting Middle Earth. And the, also it, something that you're all talking about, the, a, a love of the frailty of mankind, that they're aware of the fallibility of them, but also it's one of the things that fascinates us and uh, that we love about them. I like that quality quite a bit. I could keep you here all day long, but I'm not allowed, so I have to say goodbye. Congratulations. Thanks and for everyone having us. out there, Thank keep you. an Thank eye out you. for Rings of Power. Thanks for having us.